Welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast that has the science and the screaming to determine what the best movie is of any given year. This year is 2002. Go back 21 years and remember what that was like. Before I introduce this week's panelists, know that this show is also a game in which points are awarded for well-made arguments, cogent thoughts about the film, jokes, and anything else I feel like awarding. The winner will be my best friend for a week, have gloating rights, and give me my daily morning delivery of blueberry muffins kind of slacked on that i didn't think i had to say it every week i'm bringing it back (laughs) your winner from last week and he had to beat out two people for it is give it up for the one the only ryan roger rogerson hey mike i'm so sorry about the slacking on the muffins i just thought that when you got a basket of muffins every morning you would hand some of them out and not eat them all to yourself and so this is sort of like a you're you're becoming clumpish let's say and i thought that maybe uh we would hold back on the muffins maybe every other day they're my muffins i will eat my muffins and should i not still living like the pandemic's going because that's what i've been doing <laughs> where you would crawl out and eat them on the porch and then run back into your house yeah scurrying like some sort of tubby raccoon <laughs> yes to wash it in the sink do you wash your muffins <laughs> you you got to. Yeah, That's I mean, where I, the vid I, comes from. I don't know who's touched them. Spraying it down with Windex. Also, I just like why is any part of the muffin dry? I want a wet, moist, sopping, mm. water-filled muffin. Sopping, damp, gooey, oozy muffins. <laughs> the guy who knows a thing or two about sopping, damp, gooey, ooey muffins. Give it up for Greg. Thank you, everybody. Mike, I just want to point out that uh, it has not been my fault that you haven't been getting muffins recently because I haven't won in about three weeks. So you can't blame this guy. Not to brag, but my extended losing streak once again proves I can't be blamed for anything. Weird reaction from the crowd. That got them all horned up. <laughs> the crowd sat on their hands when we were talking about ooby gooey muffs. Yeah, dude. But yeah. Nothing? They loved, <laughs> they loved to hear... <laughs> oh, I, I don't know why we gave that one person in the crowd a microphone. <laughs> it's always fun. You never know what they're going to do. <laughs> one audience member is mic'd up. <laughs> <laughs> mic'd up and horned up. <laughs> the way we like them. <laughs> you know, Taste Buds, we got to laugh because we're talking about a very serious movie. Of course. That takes place during a very serious time, so we're getting all the levity. I know normally we like to have a lot of fun and make your little fart and dick jokes, but uh, that's not what we're here to do, because it's the 25th hour, which is no laughing matter. Very serious. Yeah. Never forget. Yeah. Never forget about the 25th hour. Don't be like the rest of the world and forget <laughs> that this movie ever was made. Uh-huh, yeah. That- <laughs> Did you guys? I I could see myself on the intro fighting for this. I love I love when the three of us do a Spike Lee movie. He's in the Hall of Fame. I think it brings out some incredible conversations. Um, was it just me like going to town on this movie and you guys being like, "All right, whatever, bro." Yes, I yes I vaguely remember. There's three things that sealed it. Uh, it's Spike Lee done. You didn't need to keep talking, but you fucking did. Uh, Spike Lee directed it. Edward Norton, uh, I think, is always an interesting actor. And then, this is our one movie of O2 that deals with the big nine. Well, I think all of them do, right? We jam well, it in next there. week's The Twin Towers certainly does. <laughs> <laughs> Man, can we... Is there any way to just, like, take a quick break from 9-11 jokes on the movie called The Twin Towers next week? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, not with Taylor on it, right? No, he that guy is a scamp and a half. Yeah, he was perhaps too young when the initial tragedy occurred, and so he's got sort of an irony-poisoned brain. Right. I just started making fun of Pearl Harbor. <laughs> too the soon, movie. too late? Uh-oh. No, <laughs> I had a whole bunch. If you were the greatest generation, maybe you wouldn't have gotten bombed. <laughs> Stuff like that. I like <laughs> the generations that don't get bombed. Things of that nature. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, like I, I think that this is a movie who, that came out and was basically ignored, um, as a lot of Spike Lee movies have been. Like he makes way more movies than anybody knows, uh, at least in this like uh, fifteen year period before sort of I'm gonna guess Black Klansman came out. Now his movies are I think are a bigger deal. Um, but that for you guys to like not even have known about this movie makes me glad that we watched it, but also <laughs> maybe it shouldn't have made the Sweet Sixteen. 
Well, so if it was Elite Eight, it would not be here. I mean, it's a- based on the first segment. We're not getting into it yet. I'm just saying based on that first show when we don't know a lot about any of the movies yet, it would not have made the Elite Eight. But we were like, let's just do more because of stuff like it's this. It's a Hall of and Fame now, director, too. I mean, Hall of Fame director. Yeah. How and by, many of those do we have? You, you said Edward Norton, but you're not talking about the most talented actor of the group his friend barry pepper guys barry pepper's in this movie you you got a killer cast and you're like oh shit a young rosario dawson oh shit an old but not super old brian cox oh shit a young philip seymour hoffman oh shit is it barry pepper that guy with the eyes you sort of recognize <laughs> pepper is hot it's a hot pepper yeah, you know what? I feel like we're we're all itching, we're aching to get into it. We got so pepper in just, our pants. We got pepper in our pants, and we don't know how to dance when we come back. The twenty fifth hour. Years before, he would adapt one of the most famous modern fantasy series for HBO. A little fella named Damon Benioff wrote a book called The Twenty Fifth Hour, which followed a New York drug dealer Monty Brogan after his drug after he's arrested for drug possession and sentenced to seven years in prison. He spends his last night of freedom with two friends, his girlfriend Natural, while contemplating his uncertain future and the decisions he made that brought him to this point. Toby Maguire read an advanced copy of that book and wanted to play Monty so bad he pushed Benny off to turn it into a movie. But then Maguire, unfortunately, got caught up in some arachnid based film flim flammery nobody ever heard about, <laughs> and Edward Norton would be cast as Monty. Taking a liking to what he calls the fuck monologue, a little first four-time pop filter return champion Spike Lee hopped on as director and refused to cut out that monologue when distributor Disney asked him to. While making the movie, a little fella called 9-11 happened. <laughs> Spike decided to embrace the tragedy, weaving it into the movie. Taste buds, I ask you this. In his four-star review of 25th Hour, Roger Ebert makes the claim that because of Monty's situation, everything he sees is, quote, more focused, more meaningful, sometimes dreamy, end quote. Do you agree with Ebert here, or does this seem like a way to justify Lee's jolting, visceral, sometimes awkward style? I, To me, it seems like both. Like, I think, uh, or how about this? I think that it's Ebert, another pop filter Hall of Famer, and somebody that we all know. Oh, yeah, um, right, trying to trying to come up for with like very Never logistic forget. reasons why this movie is the way it is and the way that the, the only reason that you need for the way the movie this is the, the way the movie is the way it is is because of one spikel lee i think it's spike is short for spikel um, yes it is his biblical name it is crazy and there is so much to get into but there like there's so much bad there's so much uh nonsensical but that's just like the way that he rolls and i don't coming think out of the you, gate you're just talking about how there's so much bad i love it i don't think that you need to have that extra dream sequence when the thing that i keep that, that i keep thinking about is how uh natural played by rosario dawson is being led into a different interrogation room and giving this look of like oh i'm so sorry i um am about to betray you or i have <laughs> just betrayed you that's all right. movie bullshit that's all in edward norton's head but it's oh, yeah. it, we don't have to have this like thought of uh, Monty being like in this place where everything feels like a movie. It's Spike fucking Lee. What uh? What, what are the parts that are dreamlike or feel like a movie that you're talking about specifically? That I'm talking about specifically. Yeah, or that e that you're talking about that Eber's talking about that Spike Lee was making. I mean, it 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 feels like not exactly. It feels very much like a novel. Like it it mm -hmm. in that it's just it it seems not based on. <laughs> reality so much as based on different types of fictions that we like to tell ourselves um, i think the whole thing of like the student showing up at the club and then he brings the student in the club and then everything kind of in the club the weird lighting i think it is supposed to both be dreamy and realistic like this is such a surreal experience the idea that you're going to spend your last night before going to prison where terrible terrible things are going to happen to you and you're not sure exactly like wh how you're going to come out the other side. I don't right. think you could show that in a realistic way because there's no way it's like a normal experience. Everything must feel surreal and dreamlike in that. 
What makes more uh, sense to me, and I'm not like disagreeing. It, maybe Ebert and I are saying the same things. We often do. We're of the same level, caliber, as far as movie watchers go. Is that uh, this this whole? I like movie... how he just said movie watchers. He didn't even say like critics or like. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we watch uh, them the same way. <laughs> movie watch good now. Uh, <laughs> is that this is like Monty's uh, memory that he has all seven years in jail of like that night. I'm gonna hold on to this night, and it's like it's a little you know uh, all over the disjointed. place, disjointed. Colors are different. Um, even the like the time like it takes you a second to get into this movie. First of all, I noticed that uh, it's not until like 45 or 50 minutes into this movie where you sort of get your uh, a grasp of the premise. Yeah, like, if you don't know what this movie is about going into it, it takes you a long time to be like, wait, why is he acting like this? Well, there's a cold open, Uh and then because of what that is, uh, trigger warning, content warning, uh, there's just a dog who's brutal. This is fucking nuts, Mike. I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is fucking nuts. While the Touchstone Pictures logo comes on, there is a dog being beat to half or near death, and that... You want to talk about things that you can get away with? I do think that you could remake Blazing Saddles uh, today. Like, I do think that's possible. You could not do this again. There's absolutely no way. I think the genius of Spike Lee is to what we now call grizzly manning this shit. Uh, We're not going to (laughs) show what's happening to the dog. We'll just let you hear it. For our listeners, what they do is they show Spike Lee listening to a dog <laughs> get beaten, and he sounds very upset. Whoa. And then we cut to the dog covered in jam, and we understand what has happened. Jam. That would be not out of place for what goes on in this movie, if that is how Spike had started it. <laughs> uh, I mean, they, they it, it feels like they hired some intern to edit the whole movie. You see stuff twice, real quick clips, and not like MTV generation real quick clips. But wait, he does that, right? Isn't, isn't that a Spike Lee move? Doesn't he show things happen twice like that in quick succession yeah is this gonna be a thing where me and greg having uh put spike lee in the popular hall of fame are gonna come on and have to educate mike the new tiktok guy with the new tiktok following how movies work no i fully was part of putting spike lee in fuck you and your revisionist history i, I was just I making think you a actually joke. voted against it but ryan and i voted for it so hard it has to be unanimous mm, i guess I Ryan, is this your memory of it no i'm taking I... away points from both of you <laughs> what I remember, double technicals, that's meaningless. I remember Mike saying, I double vote against him, and Greg and I, well, we double vote for him, and then he got in. Yeah, because with, with four votes. Ford. Yeah. It has <laughs> to be, you, you, I hate you guys. Uh, he wears my favorite color all the time. He's my favorite height of any person. Yeah, th- no, he these are makes great. interesting movies, even when they're bad. These are great <laughs> reasons to uh, respect a director. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, like, I think that I'm going to say the same thing that I said when we were watching... Um, we were talking about Black Klansman or really any of his better movies. Uh, he is capable of doing bad. But is that uh, just don't make any Spike Lee film your first Spike Lee film. <laughs> <laughs> that is hard to do. I know. It's, good it, advice. it's hard. But because if you uh, like there's so much that is jarring in this movie and it seems like uh, poorly like you are doing something bad that is jarring. Uh, like, you know, some of the editing decisions that um, if, if this is your first Spike Lee movie, you're like, no, is this guy a hack? Is this guy an NYU student? And maybe to- lo- like the towards the lower percentage of his class. And I think that his name demands that you rewatch think it, about it or at least rethink. Yeah. Uh, and yet, no, the, 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 the thing I pointed out, I was joking, but there is the problem with the Spike Lee isms throughout it all is I kept being like, oh, I've seen you do better this exact thing but better <laughs> i can think of another movie where you pulled this off oh this is like do the right thing but dumber the fuck you monologue uh spike you've done much better yeah I, I i mean i think that the fuck you monologue works i think that like it's he owns it so much that i i think that it's okay for him to use it again also the backstory behind that and i know that this is metatextual so maybe it doesn't count but how that monologue was in benioff's uh-huh. novel and he had cut it in his script and lee demanded it because it's so spike lee right and it's so perfect for this time of like i'm lashing out you know i like whether you talk about edward norton's story or new york city story as like just recovering from 9 11 it's so perfect of this time well you know what like fuck all of these other disgusting people some of them rightfully disgusting some of them you're just a racist, bro. Right. You're just reaching out to try and fuck other people. Uh, I, I I do think it was a perfect placement in the movie. I, I think what undercut that part for me 
is is the end because the whole time i was like oh this is a dumber version of do the right thing and at the end he was like no fuck you monty like i don't know like okay so the See, character's that's what realizing I, it right now like a character screaming this is what i'm going through right now i just expect better from spike do you though because i honestly i think that that is part of like what you get with him is decisions that you always are like i don't know about that and i'm not saying you're wrong mike i'm just saying that like that's part of loving him as a director i like so many directors that i really love i think all of their decisions are correct he's the only one who i love and i'm like half of the time i'm just like really i don't know and i think it's something about that like not always being so won over Mm -hmm. that makes him more interesting because he's like not trying to always please you and make you understand and make you feel comfortable a lot of the times he's like i think he's doing him a lot like i think he just like has you know, he has a way he wants his movies to be. And as long as they please Spike Lee, that's like kind of good enough for him. And maybe that is like appealing in a way. Or as long as he like, he's sort of like, uh, I don't want to use this word, but like the Joker of film directors of like, I just want to create this chaos in the brains, in the audience, you know, in the brains of the audience. And like when they talk and like, I just think it's funny. And so I, I don't think Mike is wrong about, the ending. Well, maybe it's you, Monty. How about Fuck You, which is very after school special. Yeah. But then uh, this is something that we've come to expect from him. And then I think that like there's an added bonus there where he tries to scratch the fuck you off the, the bathroom mirror and <laughs> cannot. That's on there now. Like, you're not just going to easily scratch it's that away. It's bro. Mm. <laughs> and that's, yeah, I, I think why why we as a podcast, I would say collectively, this might be movie of the year's favorite director because he's the chewiest guy. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. It's, and because that, always... unsettled, that unsettled feeling he gives you is mm-hmm. just an, in, like, it's a fascinating, riveting feeling. And and there's stuff he does. If, if this was, who else was a big director in 2002? Brian Singer. Regardless of personal things, if I'd be like, nope, fuck you, I'm out. But because Lee does stuff, I'm like, now I got to think about this. I'd rub me the wrong way. Or like, I'm really thinking about it all week. But David it, I, Fincher, who does everything so cool and like mm. precise and everything. Yeah, everything's so meticulous. And I love David Fincher, but like not on the same level that I love Spike Lee because he's just a little too polished or something. It's right. like, it's inhuman sometimes. Spike Lee will just be like, you know what, man? Uh, have that character say that he's gay in this scene, but then in the next scene, say he's not gay. I don't know what it means. Just, just like confuse the audiences. Let's do I it. Can we stage just this just right to next him. to the big empty pit that is the Twin Towers? <laughs> do you think there's any way we could just have that whole scene take place right next to that? I just, I mean, the way that I think this was a little bit less spikely than what I wanted is uh, his composer, his like jazzy guy, his jazzy John Williams, who I can't remember his name, Bernard something. Um, when we move in Barry Pepper's apartment in his window yes. and we see yes. the, the twin towers and then the music is just yes. swelling where's the orchestra i think the orchestra should have been on set just playing their <laughs> fucking maybe this is russian arc uh that's and, still in my head but let's just do it let's do it guys and how about like like the music is very big in this in this movie like very mm. present all the time um but like how about like the stylistic cues that that like zoom in on the the footprint of the twin towers where the music takes like a decidedly sort of eastern middle eastern <laughs> tilt mm. i did and not it's notice like, that it's like okay wait what what exactly are we doing here and it's again i'm finding that unsettling and so it's it's worming its way into me but like the two is that a you remember remember who did it yeah, I don't know. Or is it a unifying message? Like, the, hey, this happened to all of us. And so, right. like, the music... Like, I don't know what the point is. But a big part of me just goes, like, uh, it might be important to know what the point of this is. But see, that's that's what's so crazy is that it's not him saying that this disaster was brought to you by Osama bin Laden. He's saying, with the music and the angle, the camera angle, like, this disaster was brought to you by Spike Lee, bitch. You, you'll, <laughs> you'll never forget what I did here. <laughs> and, like, it's so impressive way. to me. <laughs> Just that, like that, that wormy thing that, like, I we, we'll call it chewy thing of like, I, I mean, like, there's so many segments tonight, and we're just gonna fight about them. We're yeah. just, we're just going to. And at the end, Mike is gonna be like, before this podcast is over, Greg, I need you to punch me right in the face. And Greg, you're gonna do it. You gotta do it. <laughs> punch me as hard as you can. You told me you would do anything for me, Greg. I did. Make me ugly. <laughs> <laughs> 
I can't do it any better than God already did. Paint me like one of your oh. German girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to recover about that during a quickest of breaks. And when we come back, we're going to dive deep into our buddy, Eddie Nortnort. Taste Buds, it is time to do what we like to call here a career retrospective. We awesome. Have a bracket of. 16 of Edward Norton's most notable roles. And this gentleman has been in 54 movies. You haven't say, heard of a lot of those. Like I said, he's been in 14 of these 16 roles. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are just guys I've heard of. I mean, Eddie Furlong was in a movie with American History X, sure. so I put Terminator 2 in here. <laughs> what? I'm not going to go to IMDb. I go to the thinking hill that we all go to think yes. and just thought about Edward Norton movies. Listeners, you know that it is our longstanding rule that it is illegal to do any research to be on this podcast. You just have to come with what you take from the link, from the thinking hill or what you're able to glean from watching the movie one time at 1.5 speed. Mm -hmm. Who is in the Hall of Fame, Pop Filter Hall of Fame, sooner? Edward Norton or Jim Norton? That... Shaved head comedian who uh, saw, oh, is that where the right's going? Will they laugh at my jokes? I'll make jokes for them then, I guess. I do think he was prescient. He feels like he started a little earlier than the right was going that way. Good for him. Good Man, for he was him. like the most degenerate <laughs> comic of all time. How did he manage to... <laughs> it's not important. Well, let's get started, and we're going to go chronological, because listeners, we heard your notes last time. So... Starting with Primal Fear versus American History X. Oh, wow. Big so right out the gate. Primal Fear is sort of what put him on the map, right? Um, right. And I think Primal Fear was equal to Sixth Sense in that... Uh, twisty ending. Twisty ending and like, oh, man, you got to go see this because of the twisty ending. Um, but it was like it, it elevated uh, Edward Norton to a whole... Like he was at the upper echelon of talented actors after this first movie really yeah i, I mean have you guys seen it do you rem remember it? i've seen it yeah oh and i remember the twist it's definitely one of those movies like six cents is a good way to put it ryan because if you were to take the twist out of it and you were like what how did you enjoy your experience watching this movie you'd be like yeah i don't know that's okay yeah but the twist makes you feel like fired up at the end of it and so i think that carries it a lot it's also hard because it's one of those uh, 90s and uh, early aughts movies of like, uh, so here's the story. What do you want to call it? Oh, I don't care. Like, uh, put any <laughs> title on it you want. Primal Fear? Sure. Why not? <laughs> Who but cares? Ultimately, it's one of those kind of performances where it's two different broad performances, but they're different from each other. Like, they're enough different from each other that people get impressed. But it's like, I don't think it's two subtle performances. That's the thing is that these two performances Whoa. combined sort of make me think. And I don't really know where I stand with Edward Norton. I feel like so I've grown up with So he plays two him. characters in this? Yes. Yeah, the twist is about like he kind of his whole demeanor changes like usual suspects style. Like you Evil had thought kids. of him one way and then he like mm -hmm. turns out to, to be a different way. Which is, I guess, the reverse of American History X. But like these two movies together uh, got people so hyped up i feel like that he is sort of the shawshank of actors and that you're doing very obvious things i really i think i do like him as an actor but and we might get to movies later where like i'm like this is where it clicked for me mm -hmm. but he's, he's a hit or miss all-star isn't he i mean it's either like yeah. a, a great performance or an absolute disaster and plus there i mean there's all the talk of like what a piece of shit he is as a person oh really yeah i think he in the in the classic not i don't think in like uh gross way though maybe but like i haven't heard anything gross things just in the classic like well you're an actor from the 50s style of like just being mean to everybody because he's an artist mm. i mean he gr got thrown out of the mcu and jonathan majors has yet to have that happen to him so <laughs> he was just a prick yeah i think he's he uh, i think prick might be the best word it, it is so weird now that we see, like, in hindsight, his whole career, to think about his early stuff, we're like, look how scary and tough he is. Because I'm like, <laughs> little Eddie? <laughs> little Eddie Norton? Uh, the <laughs> Moonrise Kingdom guy? <laughs> I mean, uh, it's 25th hour, he's like, what, what's going to happen if I show up to prison with a face like this? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I know I'm pretty. I guess that's why Tobey Maguire, I, I could see that, you know? 
The only question is, how is this guy actually out on the street slinging if he, like, is so baby soft? I'm also done, like, fucking done with giving any extra points to weight gain, weight lost, muscle yeah. gained, muscle lost. Like, his yeah. American History X basketball game. scene is, like, this all-time classic. Look how buff he is. I don't fucking care. I can but, do that. I do do that. I do that every day at the gym when I shred and rip. And that's mm-hmm. where you get all the Oscars that we give out. It doesn't affect me. But that that's so interesting because that's so early in his career. It's not like, oh, look what he did. At the time, it's like, yeah, that's a buff guy, I guess. Yeah. Like, it's not I, Christian Bale style. I'm Mike, I think it's clear that Primal Fear did not ripple out to your world. I think it was no, a well, Primal Fear was big, Mike. It came, it came out of age that I constantly confuse it with. Primal Fear, Cape Fear, Fear. And I've never seen any of them because I get confused and walk away from Blockbuster. The three types of fear, <laughs> as any yes. psychologist would tell you. <laughs> uh, because of that, well, let's vote. I don't, I don't want to vote on the scale. So who knows what I could have said there. <laughs> Greg, which one do you think is moving forward? I think I'm going to have to go with... Dude, Primal Fear. It put him on the map for me. And I know what I said that they were two broad performances, but I have to speak for little Greg, who was impressed by that twist in that movie. I This this could have ended up being the finals. Yeah. Like that's how important they were to his career. Um, but I am also going with Primal Fear. Uh, it takes an actor to make that twist work. And American History X was a lot of... I think it's like... It's, it's not... A, a good movie like when you look back on it, it it's mm-hmm. much more shocking than it is good um the and i think that scene yeah it's just like oh and we're from hb so if we want to see neo-nazis we just like <laughs> go just stand up my window. corner <laughs> look I at the up, jacked up trucks i blow this special whistle i have and they all come running <laughs> <laughs> it's a dog whistle um and <laughs> yeah i think it's primal fear. all right primal fear moves on also moves to the top of Mike's going to watch sometime soon, Q. You know who else it stars? You know who the main character is? 2002 superstar Richard Gere. Oh, yeah. Man, he was on one in 2002. He's like, I'm about to go away for a long time. Not like in a weird way. He just stopped being in stuff. Going on vacation. (laughs) Because I've been in so many good movies. You deserve it then, bud. Yeah, go, Gear. All right, next up is Rounders versus Fight Club. Now, before we get to the second one, uh, Moody's Movie of the Year's first episode, have you guys noticed the crazy uptick in stock for Rounders? Yes, and it's weird. And it's, why? Just because time has passed? What is Rounders? I know Matt Damon's in it. Is it Boiler Room? It's poker. <laughs> it's, it, po- it's poker, Mike. People, people were very excited about poker in the early yes. 2000s. I don't know if that's true, though, Greg. Some people credit Rounders for creating the excitement that gave us the constant hours of poker on ESPN. I guess I thought it went the other way. Like, not that it got very big and then Rounders came out. I thought it was kind of lurking. Mm -hmm. And then Rounders came out. And then, yeah, I guess it blew up after that. But I I feel like there was, like, the early days of poker were, like, around the time Rounders came out. Because, yeah, you can't just make something out of nothing, right? I, I think it was bubbling. And Ocean's Eleven, right? So it was probably in the celebrity scene because it was Ocean's Eleven is 01, correct? Yes. 01 or 00. So poker's uh, a bubbling. That's hey. why, uh, briefly to show some leg, I wrote for a company in 2015. They're like, we want a cable channel. That's all poker. And I was oh, like, wow. I think you guys are so late. Yeah, yeah. didn't you guys <laughs> miss this by a lot? I want to make Cigar what? Aficionado the channel. <laughs> and they, We're going uh, big on Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> America's mayor. America's mayor. <laughs> I've heard that people want 24-7 of fidget spinners. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this also, um, Rounders also features the uh, performance, the villain of Rounders, or the antagonist, or whatever you want to call him, by John Malkovich, that makes Tony Saragusa in 25th Hour look like the most organic <laughs> uh, Russian born Russian in the history of time. This is John Malkovich going like, Hello, what is poker? We're playing it now. That's, he was Scottish as well. <laughs> he was also The worst Scottish. kind of Russian, the Scottish Russian. <laughs> but yeah, it's, there's, there's I didn't little... know if I was like in the bubble or not as far as like rounders goes. Uh, mm. the, uh, just to me, the other one seems like such a bigger deal. I think it's undeniable. Okay. Yeah, it, it's too big. Uh, our our own opinions of it, notwithstanding, I think too big to fail. 
It's too, too big to fail. Yeah. All right, Club. The yeah. Bank of Movies. Uh, this one next fi- one is fun. Uh, Keeping the Faith, which is the rom com where Ben Stiller plays a rabbi and he plays a priest, and they're both trying to date the same woman. Ah, hi, Jinx. And just Versus, so we can exactly date what year this movie came out, it was Jenna Elfman. Yes. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> Her one movie, if you don't count Can't Hardly Wait. And Krippendorf's Tribe. And oh, let us not forget Krippendorf's Tribe. Uh, it's going up against the score, which he Eddie Nortz co-stars with Robert De Niro. I assume it's just your generic crime heist insert whatever bullshit here. Is this the one that also had Marlon Brando? He was not dead yet. <laughs> I'm not dead yet, bitches. No, I'm not. I'm there's, not dead movie. yet. There's two heist movies that came out. Yeah, it's Marlon Brando. Wow, cool. Directed by Frank Oz, the voice of Miss Piggy. Uh, dude, I'm voting for this one. I have no idea what this is about. I don't even remember which, what it's called. That's the one I'm voting for. <laughs> I Spore? like. I like Cosmetic. keeping the faith. The score is so bullshit forgettable. Keeping the faith is not a success, but I like that they tried. Yeah. You know, like now that we have no rom coms, we have to reach back and make some of our mediocre ones classics. We just have right. to anoint them. Uh, I remember seeing it in theaters because this was of the era where I saw everything in theaters except apparently the score. Uh, and I enjoyed it. The only scene I remember is that um, there's this lady that uh, says that she has rock hard abs and keeps demanding Ben Stiller punch her in the abs. <laughs> and so he's like, no, 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 no. And then finally does and just knocks the fucking wind out of her and she drops to the ground. Is that what you think is funny, Mike? That's what you think boys hitting girls is funny. Sound well, if they demand funny? it, yes. Uh so we got one for the score, one for keeping the faith. I get to split the, I not split. I get to vote. Push you get to vote. The faith yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, keeping the faith moves on. Next up is Death to Smoochie versus uh, the attempt at the Hannibal reboot, Red Dragon. Is Death to Smoochie the most anti-Smoochie movie we've ever had? <laughs> yes. I, I can't think of. A more anti-smooching. Uh, and the other one was Red Dragon. Yeah, where he the played uh, Manhunter. Brian Cox connects it all. He played what's the Hannibal protagonist name? Hannib- he, he, Will. Will something. Will Friedel. Will Friedel. He was the little hobbity guy in Hannibal the TV show. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Uh- who gives a shit? These movies are both fucking stinkeroos. Death yeah, to Smoochie dude. is more famous because it, it's like, oh, it's Barney, but it's dark. It sucks. It fucking sucks. And I guess Hannibal's more of an IP, like, thirsty grab, and so that makes it worse, but they both suck. I just, I don't know anybody who's seen Red Dragon. Yeah, I dude. I don't believe Dragon. anybody who says. Let's just say did. Death to Smoochie and move on. Or yeah. It's just going to lose next round anyway. Next up, this is when he's like, I'm serious. I think uh, the illusionist, which is not the prestige. Some of us call it the not prestige magician movie that came out that same year versus the incredible Hulk, a movie he famously got kicked out of the MCU for. I spent a lot of time that year because you, you have to have your takes, right? You sure. have to go out on limbs uh, mm-hmm. saying that the illusionist was way better than the prestige and would be better remembered in the future than the prestige. Could be I like right. the illusionist. Is it? Is it now? No, I was wrong. No, right? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Because I feel like you can still you can still reference the Prestige, and people are like, ah, yes, Yes. I know what that is. Killing your own clone nightly, definitely. Because you're mad. Your nemesis has a brother. (laughs) (laughs) What sucks is that the Illusionist was Edward Norton and Paul Giamatti. There's this thing about Paul Giamatti movies where over time you think that it was Philip Seymour Hoffman. You're like, (laughs) and it's it wasn't. and so, but like, where are we at on this Hulk movie? This you, uh, it was made by Universal Pictures, yes. and sort of in the MCU barely because Nick Fury's at the end. Uh, Nick Fury isn't. Uh, what's his face? The, the agent. famous one, Iron agent. Man. Iron Man is at the end. Robert Downey oh. Jr. is at the end. That's pretty big. And then uh, Thunderbolt Ross comes back in Civil War, and then oh, yeah. Thunderbolt Ross, Harrison Ford is going to come back in Captain America: New Order. Uh, that's not called that anymore because that was pro Zionist or something to call something New World Order. It's called. I thought Cap- it, the... We're just calling it Captain America 4 for right now, but apparently it's just a Hulk sequel. 
Yeah, it's crazy. This is how they get because Liv is coming back. Tim Blake Nelson as the leader is coming back. Yes. We are ready. We are ready for this movie. But what about the one that we're actually talking about? I I think it got it's oft forgotten and maybe because of the fuzzy thing and it's not uh Ruffalo, but I remember people are like, Oh, it sucks. It is not it's I it's not in the bottom tier of Marvel movies. I thought like, it was kinda dope. The, the yeah. Fine, he jumps around, yeah. breaks things. Tim Roth jumps around, breaks things. Tim Roth? Yeah, I think it's an enjoyable action flick. I'm still going to go with The Illusionist, Mike. I'm going with The Hulk, Mike. The Hulk moves on. Yeah, he does. He moves on where he wants to move on. (laughs) He jumps six miles at a time. His hit when he hit, claps his hands. It's a big boom. (laughs) Clap your hands, not for Hulk. Clap your hands. (laughs) Next up is 2010's Stone. Another Robert De Niro, Edward Norton. Uh, I think mostly famous for the poster because Edward Norton has cornrows in this <laughs> going up against Moonrise Kingdom. I oh. uh, When I was talking about when it clicked, I was talking about Moonrise Kingdom. I was talking about it's. it seems so hard to me as an actor to just come on a set and be like, oh, I know what Wes Anderson does and I will do that exactly. He And in this movie, Francis McNorman does it. Bruce mm-hmm. Willis does it. But nobody does it more than Edward Norton, who's just this like perfect Wes Anderson Boy Scout troop leader. Yeah, I feel like, again, he's kind of hit or miss. And so there's times where he just doesn't seem to like get what he's supposed to be doing. He's that acting in a different the case movie. In Moose, Moonrise Kingdom. He like understood exactly what the brief was and played it to a T. This is a, a slammy D. And you'll see why he becomes a main player. Not We didn't we can't put all of the Wes Anderson-Edward Norton collabs in here. But yeah, he became part of the troupe. Moonrise Kingdom moves on. Next up is the Grand Budapest Hotel. I lied. There is more Wes Anderson here <laughs> versus Birdman or that long title. Oh, Grand Budapest. Yeah. I have a, a weird thing about Birdman. Birdman. You hate yeah. Birdman. And I honestly, I love Grand Budapest. I think that it that's like top tier Wes Anderson. We call it GBP. Keep- GBP. Even though it should be called GBH. I don't know why We're we call it that. Constantly yelling, keep your hands off my lobby, boy. <laughs> and your final battle of round one is Motherless Brooklyn. Versus Glass Onion. So Mother- that story. Mudless Brooklyn was this like attempt to reintroduce himself into like the critical and commercial world. I feel like like he was like I'm gonna do Bafo box office. Variety is gonna go crazy with the headlines, but also nominated for a bunch of stuff. Where he plays or someone around him plays somebody who is uh, mentally challenged. Oh no, I can't remember which it is. It did nothing. Like, I remember it being big because trailers played for like a year, but it did absolutely nothing. Knives yeah. Out, I was like, oh, there's the Edward Norton I love. Like, I fucking hate him. He sucks, but I love watching him, blah, blah, blah. And his Glass Onion role, he captures what you hate about Edward Norton, the real guy, in the character being like the Elon Musky tech guru. Yeah, what if I Elon- swear, he makes reference to things that Elon Musk had not done before <laughs> that movie came out. I don't know how they managed to do that. Like, get Musk to agree to act in the way that the character did. <laughs> so, Glass Onion, gentlemen? Yes, yes. for sure. All right. And the producers are telling me we've got to pick up our plate, pick up our pace. Pick up our <laughs> plates and put them in the <laughs> sink. Just Come on. you some. Mom, your mom does not podcast here. Mike, no, that's not a new show we're going to do. <laughs> oh, dude. My mom does podcast here. <laughs> Mama Mia's Here We Go Again. <laughs> has nothing to do with the movie. <laughs> Primal Fear versus Fight Club. Fuck it. I'm just going to say Primal Fear. I'm going to say Fight Club. I, unfortunately, am also going to say Fight Club. Yeah. Keeping the Faith versus Death to Smoochie. Dude. <laughs> I move? feel like if you say death to Smoochie to people, they know what you're talking about. I think if you say keeping the faith to people, they're like, yeah, I'm trying, man. I don't know. It's harder and harder every day. <laughs> I do Mike, have was 25th memories. Hour so unknown that it could not crack this 16? Yes. <laughs> keeping the faith made it, but 25th Hour could not. I'll say keeping the faith. Me too, because I find it delightful. Hmm. And again, I don't remember anything about it. Not even that hilarious Ben Stiller punches a woman. You love that shit. <laughs> the Incredible Hulk versus the Incredible Moonrise Kingdom. Oh, Moonrise Kingdom. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a supporting part, but still. But supporting quite a bit. GBP, for some reason, is what we call it, versus Glass Onion, a Knives Out story. 
I don't remember who he is in Grand Budapest, so I'm gonna go with Knives Out. Yeah, isn't it a very small part? I think so. Yeah, so Knives Out, where he's like featured prominently. All right. Oh, this one's barn burner. Who knows what could happen? Fight Club versus Keeping the Faith. <laughs> well, they both feature punching. <laughs> Fight Club. Yeah. And then Moonrise Kingdom versus Glass Onion. Moonrise. Kingdom. Moonrise. Oh, I love this, because given who we are, I know which way it's going to go. Fight Club versus Moonrise Kingdom. I think that... I do think that that Primal Fear versus American History X should have been the finals, looking back, (laughs) even though neither one is represented here. But I do think that uh, everything we know, everything we've talked about tonight with all these movies, with him in 25th Hour, of just like, I have a baby face, but I'm fucking disgusting, bro. I'm just disgusting. I do think that it's Fight Club, is the ultimate movie edward norton yeah yeah i agree i guess you don't we don't like to celebrate fight club but it's hard not to have that be like the role right that's the first thing people like if you say this if you say edward norton to people they'll either think ed norton from honeymooners or they will think fight club (laughs) do you have to say greg like in your in your bubble are you like edward norton and not from Honeymooners. Yes. Honeymooners is very big in my New York based family. Because <laughs> to the moon and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, is he going to punch her in the face this time for real? <laughs> nah, he loves her. Got close that time, though. <laughs> and he would still love her, but then he would just hit her because he loved her. So I mean, every time the wife says to Edward Norton, I want you to punch me in the face as hard <laughs> as you can. The, the idea moon. that if he ever did hit her, that would be the like obviously a controversy, but like it's cute that he threatens to do it every <laughs> single week. Also, the controversy would not be as much as you think. It'd be yeah. like, oh, no, maybe not next time. But if next ha- time, that's fine. Have we returned to the time when a character can openly threaten his wife with physical violence? <laughs> no, the woke libs are still like, yeah. no. Well, that's been Edward Norton's career. When we come back, more 25th Out. Taste Buds, 9-11 sure did happen right before this movie, didn't it? So is 9-11 connected to the action, the characters, and themes of the movie? Or does this just happen to be the first movie that Spike Lee directed since 9-11 happened? I mean, it is sort of just the backdrop. Right. I mean, unless you want to be like, this is his own personal 9-11. Like, they, it, it doesn't feel super integrated Whoa. into the movie. And I think that that is an actual strength. Uh, it is odd to see, like, everywhere he goes, just plastered with American flags. Like, even mm-hmm. just, like, on the awning of, like, a, a fancy apartment building. They just, like, <laughs> glued a flag up there. <laughs> we love America, everybody. But I think it... it, it with glue. I mean, <laughs> let's just get some glue. It kind of blends into the background, and yet, in the way that, for a lot of people, it it did at the time, it doesn't quite fully blend into the background. Like, you're just constantly aware of it every single scene, and I I thought that rang true in a lot of ways. Well, what has Spike Lee ever blended before, right? Like, it's just that, like, if he's going to make a movie post-9-11, you know, it's just, it's going to be in your face. He's going to point it out. He's never going to be afraid of being, like, too obvious about anything. Yeah. That's just sort of how he rolls. The two movies that this made me think of, uh, because I I don't, like, watching this, I was like, what the hell is this movie like? And it made me think of two movies, um, Beast of the Southern Wild, which Katrina was sort of more of a role player in. And uh, we talk about this movie a lot and we make jokes, but it's a really good movie. Bad Lieutenant... Ports of Call, New Orleans, where it really is just like this story is taking place in the aftermath of Katrina. Mm-hmm. And make of that what you will. But it's just, it has happened and things have changed. And so I think this movie is at its best when 9-11 is in the background and we can't, not to make a joke, but forget about it. But wow. it's sort of, I, I, I think it fails sometimes when it has to... When... The only time I can think of is Francis and Monty yes. are in Francis' apartment. And because he's like a Wall Street guy, he lives right down in the financial district. And they are just staring in the pit that we talked about. And it's like, before. like it kind of seems like maybe they're contemplating this thing that's going to happen to their friends. And that's why they're so sad. But mm. it feels very much like they're like, man, 9-11 happened. And this just changed everything. 
Even Philip Seymour Hoffman's Yankees cap seems like right. a little bit like that was, New York, baby. Yeah, but it that's the most in your face moment, I guess, is when they're literally looking yeah. at the big hole where it used to be. And that's also a moment that felt a little fake to me because like and I could just be totally wrong here. But I think of that as being as the Twin Towers being in like the um you know, the business district. Like, did people live right next to that? Yeah. I feel like that's not a real thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I avoided that part of town when I lived there because fuck those douchebags who hang out in that area. Uh-huh. So douchebags like Barry Pepper? Like Barry Pepper and his sad doggy eyes. Do you, you guys- call Barry Pepper a douchebag? <laughs> you know what? I would. <laughs> Based on all of the evidence I've gathered in this movie. I mean, did you guys find yourself forcing the thought? I got a podcast this week. I'm watching a Spike Lee movie. What? Why? What is this? What does this mean? And I think is that part of Spike's point? No. Be, so there's that scene, and then there's so much Spike going on throughout the rest of the movie to the point that at the end of the movie, when Brian Cox shows up in his like Jeep Cherokee, and there's a absurdly big American flag on his antenna, I forgot when this took place, and I was just like, "That's weird. Why does he have that?" Like it, it, it washed the the movie, and Spike took me away from being like, "Oh yeah, nine eleven. I feel like I we, forgot. We went through an extended period, maybe from like the the nineties up until two thousand, where nobody would like fly an American flag. Like it would just it was like not done, and since nine eleven, like we're almost approaching nine eleven levels of like flag coverage. At least in my personal neighborhood in Orange County, yeah. California. Like, well, I, I mean, I think that the right has turned it into yes. their own symbol. You know, like it used to be red hats, and now it's just like, despite being as unpatriotic as possible, if you're a lot of the conservatives I know, uh, like that's just you you own that now. So it's like a way to tell people. <sighs> And then th- in my neighborhood, there's like so many different variations of it too. Like I'm I'm for America, but cops in America mm-hmm. or firefighters in America. Blue I need a matter. flag for appreciators of thick thighs. That's my America. <laughs> the thick blue line. The thick, <laughs> the thick blue line. There, there's a truck that's always parked near my house that has on its hood it's painted on there and it's like the the blue line one but it's a yellow line and i have no idea is it for electricians i do not know what the yellow line <laughs> means i truly cannot fathom don't park on the yellow line don't but that's what it means don't park on my don't own. park on me with the snake not parking on itself <laughs> and i also do feel like there is the movie leans into it in the ways that we've talked about but i also do feel like if you are a filmmaker you almost have to weave this into what you're doing because you are there with the cameras like you're actually trying to document life even if it's a uh you know a, a movie like you're trying to show what life was like at that moment and you can't walk down the street without seeing all these flags and all these you know never forget um stickers and stuff like that yeah i think the thing you would that- have to take all the flags down like when they film the americans it's, <laughs> it's all the old timey cars and that kind of shit but he would have and i i think even spike lee was like well i'm not taking flags down in new york right now and he's such a new york guy right oh yeah for sure he yeah he likes new york from time to time i think that the thing that sort of betrays that though greg is the the uh, 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 maybe one of the shots of the movie as far as this conversation is concerned which is uh Hoffman and Pepper in the hotel or the, the apartment yeah. that moves in on it and i think that the other thing that we're working with and again it's so hard to like map out what spike was thinking because it it doesn't feel like all blueprinted and storyboarded before he goes in is what i want to do is i'm going to create this profound sadness throughout the entire thing yes. i want to <laughs> I want to make people that are watching this as sad as fucking possible. And if I'm going to use 9-11 to do that, that's fine. But I can't remember a time where I was just so... It's not like I was crying. It's not like I was, uh, you know, like weeping, like, woe was me or woe was them, woe was these characters. I was just so fucking sad about everything that happened here. And I think that to throw the Twin Towers into the background or the foreground of that is a tool. Is it... I don't know if it's like a good tool or if it's like a a non-manipulative tool but it is a tool it might be a hammer when you needed like an allen wrench right i do have to say like the one thing and it turned out not to be totally true in the ways that we said it at the time but 
we said like things would never be the same ever, ever again. And so in that way where he is dealing with this, like this thing is going to happen and there's no way around it. And no matter how he approaches it, it's going to change him forever and probably ruin him. Um, probably make him more violent and probably make him lash out in inappropriate ways. Whoa. And those, like are America? Things, <laughs> those are the things that really did happen, right? Like we thought we were going to get attacked constantly. And so we were terrified for that reason. And it did change us, but it, we became the like agents of bellicosity in the world. We did go to UK and say, hey, before we go to Iraq, I need you to make me ugly. <laughs> Fuck us up, UK. And they said straight up and to Mike Gravano, God made you as ugly as he possibly could. <laughs> <laughs> There's Love that this is going to be a reoccurring thing. Can <laughs> we just like, just to, let's just play with this thought real quick. Not a real thought, but buildings erect. Seven. Giant boners knocked down. Do we think that has anything to do with like what is going on sexually in this movie, where everyone is sexually confused or destroyed? And maybe it, the two don't have to do with each other, but I do sort of want to talk about the fact that like every like it goes from Barry Pepper, who's so uh, sexually fucked up that he has to put numbers on people, to uh-huh. Philip Seymour Hoffman, where he is like, "Oh, I'm obsessed with your tummy tattoo." Therefore, I'm going to do vile, vile things. Even though the number associated with you is 16 or 17, <laughs> which is too low a number. <laughs> um, Edward Norton saying, hey, I hate my friends for looking at you. Naturel, could you please wear the sluttiest dress that you have tonight <laughs> to go out? Are, is there anything there? I think it might be because, because they were already making this movie, right? And it's based on a book that came out pre-9. Uh it's an accidental what do you mean, eight? metaphor. Is that what you call it, eight? Eight, eight, eight. Pre nine, aka eight. Uh, it's an accidental metaphor. I think you could easily argue in some sort of film class paper uh-huh. that this is this That's is going on. That's the fucking worst insult you uh-huh. always give me, and I hate it. <laughs> film as literature, English three eighteen. I'm sure this could be your midterm project. <laughs> but uh, I don't think it's not there. I just don't know if Lee was like, see what I'm doing here? I actually asked them to knock down the building so my impotent metaphor could work. What I think it's closer to is a combination, equal combination, between what the smart thing that Greg said and the college-level bullshit that I said, <laughs> which is this thing happens, right? And it unleashed this stuff, and it's it didn't make us all good like we're pretending to be. It didn't make us all brothers like we're pretending to be. It made us sort of realize that like we're all fucking disgusting. I do think that... That's we're not brothers. Disgusting we're disgusting brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I chose two different words for those two words. Uh, but yeah, like, um, why not unleash these things about ourselves, and then we have nothing to deal with because the bill. Oh no, we have our guilt. We have our conscience. We have our like. You, you're terrible people. You're terrible people. It, it's so interesting that it's Monty's last night of freedom, and so they all all the friends start to act like they're doing stuff they normally wouldn't do also. Cause Monty is about to go away for seven years and could die. Yeah. So they're all acting it, which does feel like I know all of America got attacked, but New York got attacked and all of America started acting fucking dickheads about. And it. I think this movie saying that too. I mean like all of New York got attacked, but really it was this one place and it was these people that died. I, I read somewhere that the 11 firemen in the shot of Brian Cox's bar Mm. That was filmed before 9-11. Oh, they wow. All di- they all died wow. in 9-11. Holy shit. Those were the people that were affected. Wow. The rest of New York, they're just using this for this, like, get out of jail um, free card. I-, I will say the rest of America is. I'm going to push back because uh, the amount of, like, ash in the air that people were breathing in. I, I think if your city gets attacked like yeah. that, it defects I think the experience of just being anywhere around that and being able to see it, or uh, like, that would be traumatizing. I you think guys- that... Do you guys not think that there were um, Kristen Bells from The Good Place in New York well, just skating on the fact that they live in New York? Yes, and his name was Steve Ranazazi. <laughs> but I'm just saying, for the most part, I don't think New York was like, uh, no. yeah, we get to use this. I man. apologize. I'm not making a blanket statement about what New York went through. I'm, I'm talking about this is a movie about three people who went through 9-11, giving them a coupon to do whatever mm-hmm. the fuck they want. Oh, yeah. Okay. That I could see for sure. I mean... If you live right next to the building as it goes down, like I, I think you sometimes when you want to indulge, you're just like, yeah, I saw that awful thing. 
that, I mean, post nine, we all did. That's how I lost my virginity. Wait, I was like, post nine, do you mean ten? Hap- yes, nine eleven happened three years ago. So I think we should probably have sex. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Worked. <laughs> well, so you're you're I, the I was, fourth of these three disgusting I'm brothers. The you're the fourth disgusting brother. <laughs> We're going to take the quickest of breaks from 9-11 and 25th Hour to talk about 9-11 in all of pop culture. Rapper. Soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that professionally made segment. <laughs> Intro drop pad. Here's the segment where we just kind of zoom out a little, where something has been, I don't know, shadowing over the whole season, so we have to just devote a segment to it. Oh, I'd say lack of shadow, but that's fine. Lack of shadow. Pop culture's reaction to 9-11. I think a few weird things start, and this is, O2 is weird because it's like right after, so so many of the things we're talking about were made before 9-11 happened, and they just went, uh, here you go or came out before 9-11 happened so it'd be weird if they addressed it (laughs) Hmm. conspiracy a little but so we don't have to just talk about o2 just for the next like decade what happened with pop culture i'm gonna kick it off is uh country music suddenly got so popular and so insufferable wait i'm gonna kick that uh red dixie cup right up your brown ass as i believe a hit uh, yeah, I think, th- is that Keith Urban? Toby yeah. Keith. Toby Keith Urban. Here here comes a missile from the USA. Keith Urban he- is the tiny young woman that hangs out next to Nicole Kidman. Toby Keith is <laughs> the one who, like, has truck nuts. He probably right. has six or seven songs about truck nuts. If he just, it was like, oh, here's how I reinvigorate my career. So there's somebody thank- thanking God 9-11 happened. If you can imagine, this is a time where something bad happened to New York. And people in the South got angry about it. Right. It feels like we are so far away from that now. If there was another 9 11 now, they'd be like, hell yeah. Good. Uh, we did that. So, <laughs> just so as everybody knows, we, we, we put those planes. That in was there. us. Yeah. 9 11 single handedly ended the Pace Picante New York War. Oh, oh my shit. gosh. Yeah. We, it's so hard to tell kids these days about how crazy it was to have a salsa from New York. <laughs> New York City. That really uh, chaps. Are you guys that really chaps my hide people or get a rope people? Chaps my hide. Yeah, get I'm a rope is too real searching. in America. Mm. I don't think we yeah, can go with that That's a little too southern. <laughs> are you guys, when you say get a rope, are you let's hang them from a tree people or let's drag them behind our horse people? Ooh, I like that one because it seems less terrifying. I you guess know, I'm going to go with a third option that I think you sort of implied, Ryan, with like a let's tie fun knots. <laughs> <laughs> like that... Like that delightful little boy in uh, Power of the Dog, who just nobody could really understand. He just wanted to tie knots. He just wanted to tie his knots. Uh, th- this this USA rah 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 happened so much that fucking chicken fried a song that is awful, but also only about partying and drink- eating barbecue in the backyard. It's third verse. They get real solemn and serious. Uh. And the drum starts doing military, and they start talking about you know what we gotta eat our chicken fried and drink in the backyard because those people died on nine eleven. I mean. They hate our way of life, Mike. That's the thing. They try to end our way of life. They hate it. So was this like freedom? <laughs> was this really when, um, or was this before? Because all of the, I'm such a patriot. It all blends together. Like I, the only colors I see are red, white, and blue. Was this was post nine eleven, or was it post before that? Uh, when the support your troops thing really came up. Oh, post nine eleven. It was post nine eleven. Yeah. Of uh, just like no matter what any soldier did. Despite all of the uh, horrific stories that you've heard about what soldiers are capable of with their own troops, with other countries' troops, it was just a matter of fact, support them. Support them. So you're saying saying you don't support the troops, Ryan, just to be clear. I'm saying I don't necessarily. Like, I don't (laughs) don't want to get the podcast canceled, but fuck, man, some of these sound like terrible people. You know what? As a former troop, I do not fucking support the troops. (laughs) <laughs> so that's how that's our coverage for not getting us canceled. <laughs> yeah, we have one. But this was a time where, you know, like you couldn't even be like, should we? You'd be like, what's your problem? <laughs> you didn't even let me finish the question. Yeah, I know, but it sounded like you were going to question authority. Well, and do you guys remember how long that lasted? Post 9 11. How long were we, we as a group, not just the 
right, but as a group saying, support the troops, here's my flag, rah, 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 Toby Keith. I would say a couple years into Bush's second term, or like a year into Bush's second term, most people were like... So, 05, 06? Yeah, I think things started to kind of change there, and it was like, so ooh. American Idiot came out, and we all went, oh, it's oh. okay to like oh, Green man. Day again. Wake me up when <laughs> September ends. Oh, shit, September. Is that what that's about? Nine <laughs> eleven. <9/11? laughs> That's when Billy Joe became our Billy Joel. Uh, a crazy thing that also happened was uh, the Roland Emmerich school of blowing up every national monument just went away. That and war movies just stopped for a while. Which was the best part about those disaster movies is watching things you know. Oh, my gosh. Yes, fuck that White House up. <laughs> I, do, I do have to say... Uh, yeah, like you didn't get a lot of buildings being blowed up in the in the, the couple of years after. And even now, um, when like a building is shown in a movie like crumbling to the ground, mm-hmm. certainly less fun than it used to be, uh, especially from certain angles, it could be very evocative of 9-11. Well, I think so many hack directors, and I'm not talking about Steven Spielberg who made War of the Worlds talk about 9-11, but so many hack directors, Zack Snyder's, are like, Superman's just like 9-11. Uh, and it's like, I don't have anything actually to say, so that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I want to make a Superman movie, but like, what if General Zod was America that we root for and Superman was like the evil people? For me, the but the most, the most apparent thing in the pop culture sphere was just the prevalence suddenly of torture in action movies as like something the hero might do. And then 24, which basically became 24. the show of weekly torture. And the message not even being so and much... And that's just that, for the viewers. <laughs> and, then, oh, sorry. Um, and then, like, the... And not so much even just that the message being, like, that torture is permissible, but the message being that torture is highly effective. That, like, mm-hmm. you can get information you need in moments if you are willing to just temporarily torture somebody. And uh, it's... So, uh, go, Ryan. It's so hard to tell if, like, that's the filmmakers being like, well, this is what I read in the news, or if that's the filmmakers being like, I... I want to help my country and I want right. to uh, just talk to the people in the audience and I want to let them know that what our country's doing is right. It's a okay. And like, that's such the boring part about the real world affecting the movies. We are going to gentlemen, we are going to, I don't want to give anything away about the future. We're going to definitely avoid any year that Watergate could affect the movies that we're going to watch <laughs> in the next season. So we're not going to watch Dick. Uh, no, we will watch some things, Mike. But uh, if we were to do, like, say, 74 through 79, it's all, all, all of it is because of Watergate. And it's because we have been let down by the government, which means we've been let down by everything, which means we have no one to trust. It's all paranoia. And, uh, like, that's just the condor. Sure. Yeah. Um, When it's all like, let's band together and be proud like let's say ozymandias was right when he right made it seem like an alien attacked the entire world and so we all band together it's boring it's it's not there's a, it's not interesting yeah i think that the biggest travesty other than like yes torture good rah 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 is uh mark millar had the panel in uh o2 of captain america who's my boy but specifically not the Ultimate Universe Captain America, because that Captain America said, this A doesn't stand for France. <laughs> the French uh, deigned to say, hey, you guys are fucking up in Iraq. So suddenly we had to eat freedom fries. Uh, you know what's kind of interesting about that? It, the This movie is mostly about how nobody held the main character to account. That mm. like n- like his dad was kind of a non-presence because he was drunk. Uh, his friends sort of like knew what he was doing. Like everybody was aware of what he was doing and they just were like, eh, I'm not going to say anything. So nobody called him on his bullshit. Uh, when France tried to call us on our bullshit, we flipped, like this was the time of America flipping out in ways big and small. And perhaps uh-huh. the most embarrassing thing was getting so freaked out that France was just like, are you guys sure you want to do this? Cause it seems like a bad idea. And being like, we're going to change the name of everything that has France in it now forever. You just lost a best friend. <laughs> That, I mean, that's what it was. Dixie it, Chicks French. It was Barton Millhouse fighting. Like, that's <laughs> what it became. <laughs> Mom, America's swearing. <laughs> you get out of here. Okay. It's a, a, what, what makes this movie stand out is it deals with 9-11. It's so weird for so long that Gangs of New York, another movie we watched, 
Scorsese kept the Twin Towers in, and people were mad. Yeah. Because uh, America also doesn't know how to deal with, like, grief and real remembrance. Just get angry and drunk and hate your kid kind of grief. Uh, the It was the scene, the dope helicopter scene in Spider-Man, was, it was taken yeah. out. You couldn't see that. Talking about Simpsons, one of my favorite Simpsons yeah. episodes. Cockalosh. Cockalosh. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't see that for years. Whoa. Crab juice. I, I kind of <laughs> want the, the lesson of this to be... If if we can only draw one lesson, uh, now that Osama bin Laden is dead, is to just fucking chill back and not protect us so much. Like we're we're not going to change. Like the propaganda is not going to work so much that if we see the twin towers, we're going to like freak out and th- like fall to the ground and have a tantrum. And also because it, w- it was a total propaganda machine, right? Uh, you know, Cheney and Bush were like, "Oh fuck yes." Uh, show us more. We will remember. We will never never forget. And be more pissed. It's so weird to be like, well, we can't re- we can't remind people that those used to exist. Well, never, That's never forget means thing. automatically forgetting. Oh, I mean, they they literally were like, get back into the stores and start shopping. Like, if you want to fight the terrorists, we have to spend as much money as we possibly right. can. And Where so, in a win? lot of ways, a lot of the art, like the initial idea, was kind of turn away from the thing itself because <laughs> it is supposed to be purchasable escapism. But and mm, like, let's right. not. Let's not make them think about it. You know, they say they want to never forget, but let's make sure we don't accidentally make them remember. But I do think it was like this last gasp of America and American politics of, uh, I don't care who the president is. They're saying it. Let's do it. That's that's never going to happen again. If another 9-11 happens, it will be half the people saying the president saved us from that or saved it from being worse. And the other half saying the president caused it. I blame no effects as war and errorism. Mm-hmm. They started cracking that. <laughs> is no effects. And there's no effects. Think about that. <laughs> think about you know, that. I'm, not, I'm not going no, to. Means... Well, I think we've put 9-11 to bed. I don't think anybody ever needs to talk about it ever again. We did it. it. We solved it. I will say this, Mike. It's definitely uh, been less of a conversation point in this season than I thought it would be. Well, I, I think it's, again, especially because... We're going chronologically. Most of the movies came out pre nine, mm-hmm. so that is hard. If we do, when eventually we do o three o four, that's you know what's crazy. There, there weren't movies like critiquing it, and artists are supposed to be lefty and critique stuff. I feel like maybe there was little known stuff. O eight is when the Hurt Locker came out, and it's the first movie to be like shit was fucked up there, guys. Maybe we should dig into the nuances of it. Yeah, oh, and it's yeah. so long. Five years after that was Zero Dark Thirty, a movie that I've never gone back to because I think that I would go from. Oh, this is great and very informative to like, oh my God, this is horrific on a what I'm seeing level and also what they're endorsing level. Like, depiction that is, is endorsement. Pro at some point. Movie. Yeah. <sighs> this fucking country. <laughs> well, we're going to take the quicks of breaks and then come back. To talk about the 25th hour. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening so far. And let me just tell you that everything ahead of this commercial is much better than what came before it. That's my guarantee. While I have you here, let me tell you about a website. It's called yourpopfilter.com. And it's everything you need that's related to pop filter. Everything Mike, everything Ryan, everything Greg, everything Cassie, everything is there at yourpopfilter.com. While you're there, go to yourpopfilter.com slash Amazon. Make that your new Amazon bookmark and do your shopping from there. That way we get a little piece of the action and Amazon doesn't. Make sure you're also listening to everything that Pop Filter has to offer, which includes the Superhero Show Show, a podcast that covers every single TV show that's based on a comic book or comic book property, and Movie of the Year, where we sit down and try and figure out what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That's Superhero Show Show, that's Movie of the Year, and that's YourPopFilter.com. Rate, subscribe, review, bye! Taste Buds, Spike Lee made a movie about three friends. Another way to put that is Lee made a movie about three gross-ass, dude-ass, criminal dude-ass dudes who also happen to be friends. Depiction does not mean endorsement, but how does Lee handle the practice of adult men dating very young women? And does it advance anything interesting about that topic? Mike, let, can we thank the board real quick for putting this third in our <laughs> uh, segments? Because I do think it ties into the 9-11 and the Spike Lee of it all. Of like, It's real confusing, man. It's real hard to watch. And it, it's hard to watch them be people. Really, almost yes. all of their decisions are like 
gross. Abhorrent. Abhorrent. But also, um, Lee's whole penchant for like, this will make him think. Uh-huh. And then when I'm doing something poor, I'll, <laughs> I'll make him think about how I'm doing it poor, and that'll make <laughs> him think even harder. Uh, it's all here in these three guys that we have to watch. And also, how many movies focused on white dudes has he made so far? I'm going to guess Up zero. At this point? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, no, it, I, I almost felt like that was part of the challenge for himself. Yeah, there are Whoa. more mainstream movies that come later, like Inside Man, where he's just like, I want to make a heist film, you know? But, right. like, here, I think that, like, he is making the, the, the white criminals in the spotlight and the black cops be the cops. And it's so confusing. Let's hash Whoa. it out. <laughs> um, and, like, I guess I can tie it into the sort of the place we were in the culture, which was, I think we wanted to be infantilized again. And I think what you see in these men what? is that um, this is the Maxim magazine thing. Yeah, exactly. Like th- this movie, it has big Maxim Ma- magazine energy, whether it's uh, commenting on that energy or utilizing that energy to titillate or doing some sort of combination of both or trying to have it both ways. It is a Carl's junior commercial for two hours and 15 minutes for the most part. Breakdown. Yeah. Breakdown with the Maxim. Magazine so okay, energy. um, like there's a lot of weird age stuff in this movie, but on top of that, the way the women are portrayed is like extremely scantily clad. There's a mm. flashback um, where Rosario Dawson is dressed as a literal schoolgirl, smoking and like uh, uh, like on a swing. There's the whole subplot about Patricia Arquette's character, and she is not in the way she's depicted in the movie. Patricia she's not. Lo- Am I a- saying that wrong? Anna Paquin. Which are- Ann Paquin. <laughs> you're saying, you're Paquin, pronouncing both names wrong. The Ann Paquin character who um, is like a 16-year-old girl who is depicted as like having an infatuation with her teacher. but And then I think that's kind of it's, that's obviously blown up in the end of the movie. But for the whole first part of the movie, she's very much like a man's fantasy of what it would be like to have a young woman interested in you. And it so it just like the movie keeps challenging you because it's trying to get you. It feels like to be like, hey, pretty good, huh? See how scantily clad these women are. And at the same time, it's like these men are pursuing these women. And the question is, what do they see women as? Like, what do they want out of this pursuit of women? Because it seems like they just want like babies i mean they just want they want to have partners who are infants and, and they don't we'll want hold it against else. them like when francis chews out natural uh he's like you were what we all wanted and then you were like that and now i'm mad at you for being like that this whole time when Fran- yes and for the idea that you'll be like that once i'm gone right no Fra- francis is the friend francis is uh jimmy bacon nuts what is his name sad eyes barry pepper Barry Pepper. Uh, yeah, Barry Pepper at the end screams at uh, Rosario Dawson's character, Naturel, for accepting all of the drug-fueled necklaces and vacations and, like, she doesn't have to work. Uh, and he just takes her to task. And this is, I have to assume, at, like, fucking 2.33 in the morning. This is after multiple drinks. Um, and he gets out of there with just a slap, which I think is uh, lucky for him. Wow. And, I mean, his whole thing, like, this movie is also very much about how people project whatever they're personally going through. I mean, he Whoa. has, like, he's a investment banker, and it's clear that he feels very ambivalent about that. And mm-hmm. so then he, like, for him, it's very important that drug dealing is way worse than what right. he does, which Whoa. is basically financial speculation, which is, like, at the time of this movie came out, six years away from completely bankrupting the country essentially all three characters of our three dude bro dudes have a scene before we get to know how shitbag they are they have a scene of like look at how heroic they are right <laughs> like uh eddie nortnor is saving a dog that he did not beat but right. he's that, like, that's total madman theory right, right? look, at, look at, here's who cares what else he does he saves a dog i'm rescuing this dog and then um barry pepper's like well is it cool to like extort money from these particular old people like i know we're all doing it here and we're all screaming and we're all jumping around and we're all pounding our chest and we're all doing coke but like do i really want to do this i just want to sort of like go this way and then philip Seymour hoppin i guess we're supposed to know is nobody's a good teacher 
So uh, all three, like that's where we start with the three of them, and then we find out no, they're right. pieces of shit. And I think I think that we're purposefully being told that Barry Pepper and Philip Seymour Hoffman are far far worse doing things that are borderline legal or things that they will not be busted for as compared to their drug dealer wow. friend who is going to jail for seven years. Well, I think it's far worse to make out with your under or to try to kiss your to kiss your underage student uh Whoa. after dragging her into a club than it is t- <laughs> to sell somebody drugs that they want so much of the movie is like should this like going to jail that's awful this guy's going to fucking jail that's awful and it's a white guy do you guys believe that usually i would make movies <laughs> about a black guy but this guy's white do you feel worse about that i'm speaking to spike lee here uh right. but then also these two guys are gonna stay out of jail forever these two the- fucking knuckleheads the interesting complication is that flashback scene when Monty and Natural meet because Monty is not better than Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, because she was 18, but she was in high school and he was 21 because I did start doing a lot of math based on uh-huh. what they've all said. Uh, yeah, if you're an adult and you meet someone in high school, they, no, the, the answer is no. You yeah, if you're, asking, if you're asking a girl what her age is, then you pr- are probably you're not with the angels there. And I, I, Francis that, even tells Hoffman to groom Anna Paquin. The, he's like, she's seventeen. He's like, she won't be in seven months. Just play it cool. Just, just hang out with her. See, that's so much worse than hooking up with Naturel to me. You're 21 and she's 18. Terrible, all terrible. I'm not vouching. I'm not saying. I'm not like saying that any of this is good. But you're 21. You're a moron. Right. Like the the Philip Seymour Hoffman thing. He was in a position of power. Yeah. Yes, over this girl, I, the, uh, the but, power and, of. This is the whole, um, uh, what's his fucking name? It's Rain, uh, Rosebud Sled, the most famous Orson guy. Orson Welles. What's this? Orson Welles saying he hates Woody Allen. Cause, and this is Philip Seymour Hoffman is a Woody Allen character of like, uh, no, I'm, I'm just pathetic yeah. and sad. How I'm bad at girls. How could I ever be a predator? Fuck you. You are using your pathetic nature to get everything you want, you dirt. I, I got to say, Greg, that was the best Orson Welles impression of Woody Allen I have ever seen. <laughs> that was not bad. And like. I've been learning for some reason. I've been like looking. Oh, I think it's because the last episode of Barry. I've been looking up about how are all sins equal in the eyes Uh of the Lord or in the eyes of the Bible or in the eyes of the law, which I know is not the case. All sins are equal. And I think that this is a uh, uh, testament to how it's not, to how the law has decided that there are sins that are worse than the sins that are committed every day and how uh, Edward Norton has to face seven years in jail for giving you know uh, drug users drugs as opposed to these two guys and like i don't think i think that there's i don't want to say too much attention paid to philip seymour hoffman because he is a disgusting dirtbag but there's not enough attention paid to barry pepper about like what he is doing to uh the people in his city that he claims to love the you know the entire environment of the economy like it's all fucking trash and i do but we survived 9 11 so it's all fine that's why there's the scene with Natural. I feel like Spike Lee's like, I'm worried people are going to think Barry Pepper's the best of them. Dude. So I'm going to show him going off. Come on. I know this sounds like shit talking, but aren't you sort of glad that Spike Lee has never said, I'm worried about blank, and then not added an extra scene? <laughs> <laughs> like he does it every time. <laughs> I do have to say, I had not realized that the math works out so that Monty was 21 and she was 18. That doesn't. I have to say that doesn't seem as bad as I was thinking it was. I like it's hard because they have the adults play themselves as younger, and so it's yeah. hard to judge exactly what age they're supposed to be. But three years down in, in that range doesn't seem so terrible to me. But that's also if she is being honest and says eighteen, and he tries. He's like, she's like, what if I said seventeen? He's like, well, then we wouldn't have this conversation. That's when I was like, I think she might not be eighteen. <laughs> I also think that this like. Him just being at the park, you know. Normally, I'd like I would think that we don't need a flashback scene like that in a movie like Twenty Fifth Hour, where we're watching time move forward. Let's go forward right. and the, let's spend our time with the night. But I think what's so important about that flashback scene is he could have been at any park dealing any drug at any other. Uh, I've heard there's a lot of parks in New York. He was at that one where Naturel is, wow. you know, and all of these things just sort of fall into place. And he's so angry at himself in the move in the mirror. Right, like, why? Why did you fuck up? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Like, but this stuff is sort of, it just, it, it all happens. It just sort of happens more to people who fuck up more. So, so we keep saying uh, depiction does not mean endorsement, and it seems there's the maxim 
Carl's Jr. vibes over this. Is is it gross in a 2002 way, the, the way so much stuff was, or is it because it's Spike Lee and we trust him that he is making points here? I do think the part where the like veil drops, where um, the teacher does kiss the student, mm-hmm. and she she doesn't freak out. She just looks at him like her whole world has been turned upside down. Like, like that this is her borderline her catatonic. Like I cannot what? believe there's no amount of flirting. like it's her personal nine 11, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, like this is the, what? like it, you get the sense that like this has broken her and that she won't be the same. I, that I should be able to dance around and flirt as like... much as possible because I'm fucking 17. You're the one that needs to have control and not fucking kiss me. Like she can't believe this happened. She, also, she I do... probably looked up to him like as mentor and like, yeah, I'm a pop off in your class and I'm gonna fuck with you, but you're still a mentor and an adult who asks more of me. And, and he h- broke all of that. To him, that look is like, oh my god, it's finally hitting me. She's only 17. To us, she was only always 17. Wow. Are you kidding me? And I, she does a like her performance is really good because you can see the weird manic energy that she has. You can see how she's like always trying to be witty, always trying to get a rise out of him, but at the same time is desperate what? and like also just needing needing his attention, but like a completely different type of attention yeah. than he is like intending to pay and, her. And different than the guys yes. in the parking lot that she bailed yeah. on, right? Like she needs something different than both of those things. Also, I think that we're playing with, I mean, what was like the, the most popular trope in 2002, right? It's somebody with shins playing on their Walkman, mm-hmm. and they, they put the headphones on you. Like, yeah. that is added into this movie. The Manic Pixie Dream Girl of right. it all. Of, and of it I, all. I think in that moment, when you see how much it rocks her world, I do, th- or, you know, it changes everything for her. I do think there's a moment in there where you start to wonder if, as the viewer, you have been seeing more through the eyes of the male character than you have been getting a clear, what? unvarnished view. And I think that there's a lot to kind of support that in the movie that sometimes we're getting. And that might have been what Roger Ebert was talking about when we when we started off, like that there's a dreamlike quality to this. And part of it might be that you can't trust what you're seeing as the viewer. Like you have to be skeptical about the way things are being presented to you. And when that call what? falls in that scene, it really makes you think like, oh, shit. Like, if I, as the viewer, thought she was flirting, I was fucking wrong because mm-hmm. she was is a child and she's acting like a child that needs boundaries, not like anything different than that. Or you can live in this dream as long as you want, as long as you don't make the one move you need to in order to wake yourself up. Like, almost, like Wile E. Coyote walking wow. off that cliff and looking down. Uh, yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman could have lived in that dream for as long as possible of just like, I like this girl and this girl likes me. And that's the end of it until he kisses her. And my God, what a shattering awakening that is. Because like, it's hard to say without actually showing you guys, the audience of the movie, how stone-faced, oh, like, yeah. a stat- like, I, she, like this open-mouthed golem of a person. Underrated actress, Anna Paquin is. Speed round. Starting your movie with a dog beating. Strong choice, Spike. But how does Doyle help us understand the rest of the film? And why is he such a very good pup? <laughs> I like, personally, what I like is I think that uh, it makes Monty seem clever in that, what am I going to name this dog? Oh, we talked about, we said the word Doyle a lot. Let's mm-hmm. name the dog Doyle. And I mean, it's, it, it might be, uh, it might be too obvious to say, but like, it, re, it right off the bat, we know that this is a good guy who cares for what? for things yeah. and who it will protect things that can't protect mm-hmm. themselves. And so it really, it locks him in right away because we're going to see him be all questionable through the rest of the movie. But we have this like touchstone to go back to. Touchstone pictures. Hello. Uh-oh, that is the label out. that we see. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, if Monty was going to stay out of jail for the entire movie, he would have been hard and he would have killed this dog. He would have protected himself. Right. Like, yeah. put put it down and move on. Keep yourself safe. Do you think, and I don't know the book, so do you think part of it is 9-11 happened to this dog because it happens to everybody in this movie. And this is like, no matter what your walk of life is, the real New Yorkers come together because the Ukrainian, he didn't want to take care of that dog. But New York, baby, we take care of our own. Do you think a plane hit the dog? Yeah, I think so. That's what we heard in the beginning. A Small dog plane. plane. I mean, it's going to yeah. be... Snoopy was dog. flying it. Yeah, is a dog playing <laughs> a dog bear. house that Snoopy flies? <laughs> <clears throat> Ultimately, 
the movie forces us to ask ourselves. To ask society, really. The single most important question when it comes to what the movie is really trying to say. How are we supposed to understand this movie when we didn't see the first through 24th hours? <laughs> That's a good question, Mike. I want to... I want to congratulate all of us for never know, once dude. <laughs> saying 25th hour party people. We oh, got through the shit. entire podcast right. without one time dropping a 25th hour party people. I just thought for sure our old brains would go there right away. <laughs> uh, Which movie would folks. you rather party in? Honestly, that club looked like it was going off. Yeah. And Rosario Dawson's one only guys? at one of those two parties. Yes. Yeah, th- that then, was she was owning that the dance scenes. She looked like so radiant under that light and just like so full of energy. Is our casual acceptance as presented in several scenes of this movie of prison sexual assault one of the biggest indictments of prison made in the film? I I it, it, it this might be the last evidence of it. No, there was that movie with Will Arnett of Oh, the Odenkirk wrote or directed yeah something like that yeah. let's go to jail or we're off to let's jail go to prison let's go to prison and the movie poster was a soap on the floor of a prison shower like it's wow. it's Very crazy nice. how persistent this was what and it's throughout the movie he's like i'm going to get my ass fucked out of itself and everybody's like yeah nobody's like no maybe yeah not. They're like yeah you're a pretty guy you're gonna get fucked in the- this in this movie are they referencing current prison trends or are they talking about 70s sitcoms that would make these jokes hmm. i mean in, two- in 2002 was prison rape as prevalent like were yeah the- well i think it's part of the i think it's part of the culture of like not accepting anything anymore like like post 9 11 i mean i think it's a big part of that but also i think it's that we have accepted the evil that is the prison industrial complex for such a long time and that's bad enough but one of the things that we just like all understand as part of the prison experience is prison sexual assault and i do feel like this movie comes from a time before we had reckoned with like just how awful prison was as an experience and it's just like understood oh yeah you go to prison that's definitely going to happen to you probably a lot and the casualness with which like Mm -hmm everybody engages with that that's like such an indictment of our society like that you just accept that or as you guys pointed out joke about it yeah, well and and this that it, it is casual but it's not that joking but there were like family friendly sitcoms that would make yeah. don't drop the soap oh yeah jokes sure. like horrifying <sighs> 2002 movies are bright almost to a fault what is spike lee saying with the choice to make a darker film i, I it's the- pretty and grimy right yeah, and then, like, there's so much, uh, we're dealing with blues and reds, you know? Um, mm. I don't want to go so far as to be like, uh, this is when we're walking into heaven, this is when we're walking into hell, but he does like painting faces in blue or red mm. to, um, you know, show whatever is, whatever's going on. I do have to say, it was like a relief not to have that, like, super bright, like, background of every shot, the way so many 2002 movies do, That's though. sunglasses on for Yeah, the movie. honestly, it's like, nice, a, a movie that I don't have to, like, turn down the brightness on my screen to enjoy. As we said, the fuck you mirror speech is a big moment in the movie, and it's referenced again towards the end of the film. How does the speech come across, and what exactly, more can we cover that, what exactly is Spike Lee going for with bringing back the smiling faces of the folks uh, from the earlier speech? Uh, this is it's such a weird part of the movie because you can't yes. if this is not your first Spike Lee movie then you've seen Do the Right Thing and right. to watch this again it it is so weird I, like I think that it is effective I don't think it's the most effective monologue in the movie or let's say montage with voiceover but and it is effective it makes you think some things but it's hard uh, what I like about Spike Lee is like his sort of like uh, I'm gonna be Brechtian, but also bring you in at the same time. This is just this is like pushing you all, pushing everything out in front. I do have to say, uh, the speech is one thing. The reprising it to show the people smiling at the end—that is the creepiest fucking group of smiling faces I have ever seen. I would much rather see their mean mugging when he's telling them to fuck off than watch these weird smiles and waves. It's like AI generated. Dude, ass that's smiles. a not very. Far Here are a traumatized people. During Halloween. And- <laughs> These are the people that saw 9-11, and this is the best they can do when it comes to trying to smile. What ethnic or cultural group did Spike Lee leave out of the fuck you montage that you would want to see added? Oh, how about um, 
for New York, it's got to be like got people from like Barbados, like uh, Islanders, right? You want to? I'm see just them. trying to think of other groups in New York that he didn't get a chance to give the fuck you to. I wa- how about I want to see added uh, uh, the Rappaports. Just Michael Rappaport <laughs> and his entire family. Wow. Just him being like, yo, what? Fucking, like, New York. fucking New Yorkers, I hate them. I was surprised you didn't throw Quest. the Nets in there. And the fucking Nets. <laughs> Does this movie go to the shit? Well, a little too often. Three I, times, Mike. Three is, different times. This is fascinating to me. And like, <laughs> where is our oral history on <laughs> this person, this actor, who I will never learn his name. I will say Clay Davis, because apparently yes. that's the only role that he ever wants to play. <laughs> and like, this, can you guys think of another example of this? This happening? No. Where, where a guy yeah, has I, a catchphrase. I, it's almost, you know what it is? It's Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? He said, I'll be back in like three different movies. That so, became like his catchphrase that was That's more the than same thing that my back. wife said, but I couldn't think of anything that he wasn't winking at the camera and saying uh the, the oh this guy's winking as hard as hell though yeah, every time but, he Arnold, does it. but it's was not also one of the biggest movie stars at the time this is a weird character actor who's like making his nut and off he, of shit he's not bringing down the fourth wall i'm talking about arnold being like in a parody movie where he's like and winking at the camera and like in a universal studio tram ride and being like eh, i'll be back <laughs> this is just if you've never seen the wire this is just a what? thing i i don't like it i don't like it Brian Cox seems to be in every movie of 2002. Who do you hope he plays in Lord of the Rings, The Twin Towers? Ooh, uh, I think he would be a the great cave gu- troll. What's the guy that you guys always talk about is cut from the book? Tom Bombadil? Tom Bombadil? <laughs> ring a ding dilio <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, Wait, what does he say uh, when he answers the phone? Is Tom Bombadil <laughs> ring a ding dilio <laughs> uh, d- Can you guys imagine Tom Bombadil saying fuck off? <laughs> no way, He's man. Too happy. No. Mary Doll would get too upset if he did that. Is he that his wife? Everything copacetic. Yeah. What his wife or his say girlfriend or whatever. It's hard to even know what Tom Pompadil is or what uh, Mary Doll is. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for Tom <laughs> Tom Pompadil. <laughs> and all the time we have for speed round. We're going to take the quickest breaks, and when we come back. It's award season. <laughs> well, that is very very funny. Or very sad and perhaps now you have something to think about or very problematic and perhaps we have something to think about but in any event i'm sure you have some reaction to what you're listening to so why not check us out on the social media you can go to instagram or twitter and find us at your pop filter email contacts at your pop filter hey everybody keep watching them movies Taste buds, can you believe that in our Lord's Year, I guess it would be a 2003, that this was not nominated for any Academy Awards? What? This movie that I forgot about? No, I can't believe it. So wait, is that, do you think that's true? It's not that you never heard of it. It's that you definitely did hear of it and then promptly forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird that I would just be okay with that. Like, oh yeah, I probably did hear about it. Maybe I even saw it and then I just forgot. <laughs> I just forgot nope. a big part of my life. Who cares? Memory hole. <laughs> Have you guys in the entire history of movie of the year uh, been watching a movie for that week and been like, no shit, I have seen this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I've never <laughs> even heard of this before. And halfway through, you're like, I used to watch this <laughs> all of the time. I used to. I had this on VHS. <laughs> all right. So we're going to give it some awards because we disagree with the Academy about almost all things. Starting with mostly only a New York moment. Greg? For me, the only New York moment has to go to the creepy, smiling New Yorkers. Only in New York could you show people looking mad and they look normal. And then they're like, okay, smile at the camera. And then nobody can fucking do it. They're like, what does your face do? The cheeks kind of go upwards. And then you like bare your teeth. Yeah, that's good enough. Anyway, we got a long day of shooting ahead of us. (laughs) Oh, you're just a character from a Japanese horror movie? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Ryan, what's yours? Um, I, I I have to go back to the thing of because I, I I think this is what New Yorkers do constantly. Maybe I've never met one, but um, it's the camera in the apartment window with the orchestra swelling as we look at where the <laughs> twin towers used to be. Only in New York. <laughs> I mean, we we literally can't do that in any other city, Greg. Well, yeah, San, that's why San Franciscans are jealous. <laughs> uh, mine is running into your student on E when you. Are already on a night you don't want to be a part of. Uh, this feels like a personal anecdote. <laughs> nope. 
<laughs> it just feels very only in New York. <laughs> Not in Los Angeles or Denver. No, because LA is too. Spread yeah, out. there's too much sprawl. But in New York, yeah, like you're all pushed together. Because in New York, like once you're in a borough, clubs. that's your borough. You yeah. just stay in that borough. You burrow in. You burrow in. Moment you felt the most tired, Ryan. I know that this is like it. This is a layup for like when does Spike Lee wear me out? But it was <laughs> for me a when does this night wear me out? And we're like two hours into this movie and uh, Brian Cox and Edward Norton and then also Barry Pepper and Philip Seymour Hoffman are sitting down to dinner. They're having dinner now. <laughs> we are at like 8 p.m. And we have so much night ahead of us. And I was like, I was already yawning. <laughs> so early on, or, that was yeah. your Tom Wamsgans moment. Yeah. It's just like, I'm, so, I'm so tired. I'm... Shoot. Greg. I think this is what the kids call getting turnt. Um, but there's a part in the club where uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman is just sleeping. He's just, <laughs> he's just <laughs> sleeping in the club. And that made me tired in one way. But then the movie is like, Oh, this is when his young teenage student is going to try to make a move on him when he's just cuddled up in the corner. And that made me tired in a completely different way. Every young girl's fantasy to be able to hop onto the lap of a sleeping 32-year-old Philip Seymour Hoffman. That fucking chubby guy with the baseball hat. Ooh, let's get you out of those khakis. There's another point where, um, uh, honorable mention, Mike, when... Edward Norton is in the front seat, and he's like, hey, Philip Seymour Hoffman, you ready for war? And he goes, or ready for more. Yes. And he's like, what? Uh, yeah, no, I'll, uh, I'll do more. But, uh, <laughs> man, we're so sleepy. That is, I know it's honorable mention, so it shouldn't count, but that was mine, is uh, they've li- left the club. Yeah. And he goes, thank God, I get to go to the sweet embrace of my bed. <laughs> and he goes, we we're going to do one more thing. I was like, come on. And the one more they thing is like, go you. look at a tugboat. Tugboat. That's the life for me. Yeah. Seems nice. <laughs> they keep saying, like, oh no, we gotta go uptown to get you that dog. Yeah. And bitch, it's two thirty in the morning. What do you At mean we point, still have to go do things? <laughs> At this we have point, a to-do it is list. Four thirty in the morning. Anytime when I lived in New York, friends would come out and I'd be like, Well, it's one, so I'm going home. They'd be like, No, till four. Uh, fuck you. Nah. You can do it. Fuck you. I'm not doing that shit. Uh, cringiest moment, Greg. Uh, it, man, this is almost like cringe made a movie. Uh, cringe wrote a script and then cringe shot it. Uh, but uh, I'm going to go with the thing that really did make me cringe, and it happened several times in the movie. Just a lot of casual homophobia. Like, oh, I'm going to insult the hell of this guy right now. I'm going to say he sucks on penises. <laughs> like, oh, damn, you got him, man. Um, it's just like the hero does it. Like, the villains do it. It's all just like wow, there's nothing worse you could say to somebody than um, that they're gay. And it, yeah, it just, it, it really sticks out in a, in a post-2002 world. It was a different time. We relapsed and made homophobia so much worse than it was in the <laughs> 80s, in the 90s and 2000s. Ryan? Um, she. Mm. Yeah. Like, come on. I what love what personal are we doing cringe here? that is. <laughs> That's... It's so eye-rollingly stupid. When he does it the second time, you're like, that's inexcusable. When he does it the third time, you're like, dude, this is a cry for help. This is somebody who wants to stop doing this and doesn't know how. I think the third time is when it's a close-up of his mouth doing it. So we can see the perfect mouth formation. And it slows down. (laughs) This is your catchphrase in a show that no one is watching right now. Is notorious only for its terrible ratings. Yeah, like... How did he even know that, like it, like that it was gonna be a, a a shout out to a show that nobody was watching at the moment? This is like, <laughs> uh, what's her name on Hacks, the uh-huh. main character, uh, Hannah Ehrenberger. No, no, the, the other main character, name. Gene Smart. Gene Smart being like, look, I was on this six episode show on NBC in 1994. I need to do my catchphrase <laughs> from that show. <laughs> I don't need to see that from the comeback. <laughs> Uh, Mike hey, Cringe. Uh, producer Dave, can we pull out? I don't need to see that. Mike's <laughs> new catchphrase that he's going to say all the time. <laughs> Mike Cringe I don't was, need to see that. I'm so sorry, Mike. Go ahead. Uh, Mike Cringe uh, was Ryan right now, cutting me <laughs> off three times in a row. Is uh, the false ending went so long that I stopped being like, oh, this is clearly a false oh ending, God. which for a while I did. It went on so long that I was like, no, wait. 
no way, this is really the fucking movie. Then you settle down and you open up a mechanic. And at first it takes a long time, but then finally you get a few customers and that eventually leads to more <laughs> success. But then you want to close it down because you want to go back to school for a little bit and your wife supports it and that's beautiful. And then one of your kids gets sick, but it's not serious, so it's okay. You buy, you buy a new pair of Nikes and you put them on, but you're like, wait, hold on, the tissue paper's still in the <laughs> shoes. And so you pull your foot out and then you take the tissue paper out. Then you put your foot in and it's that feels nice. You go to Carl's Jr. <laughs> to get the sexiest burger. A sexy lady is eating a burger. The barbecue sauce is getting You're reading a Maxim magazine. Everywhere. <laughs> you look up, like and Maxim there in magazine. front of you is number 17 on Maxim magazine's top 100 hottest <laughs> women list. You used to read FHM, but decided you like Maxim particles. <laughs> pound for pound performance, Ryan. Uh, despite all y'all shit talking, I'm going with Brian Cox. Uh, for a couple things, I don't think any actor that we know has ever been this old, <laughs> but I don't think any actor that we know could pull off his, like, this is corny what I'm about to say. So you need to pull in Brian Cox. He and Monty have dinner. They, uh, Monty at like, when he's got like nine hours of partying ahead of him, orders the giant juiciest yeah. thing you've ever seen. <laughs> and like, that's going to sit well in the dum dum, Monty. Way to go. But uh, he barely touches it, which is what you should do in that instance. And then he leaves to go to the bathroom like, to curse at himself in the mirror for a while. <laughs> <laughs> he That's probably true. he probably knew that "fuck you" was written on that mirror. It was probably his cursing mirror. <laughs> he's probably been there more than once. But uh, finally, he's like, "I've got people waiting for me, Dad. I have to leave." And then he goes, and the bell on the door. He, uh, we hear the door on the bell, and then Brian goes like, "But Monty," and it's cor- It's so yeah. cheesy, <laughs> but he can pull it off. And then I I think that like. His monologue at the end made Edward Norton's monologue in the middle about all of the shit people of New York look like trash because Brian Cox can literally read McDonald's <laughs> copy Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. and make it sound good. You want some nuggets? Greg, fuck off! That was an excellent Brian Cox doing the ba 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 Greg, what is yours? Very hard not to go with Tony Siragusa, who is not Ukrainian but has obviously overheard some Ukrainian people speaking. Um, like through the phone. I, there's so many. Wah, 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 wah. I literally <laughs> feel like I never have the courage to say anyone other than the protagonist, even though it's power for power performance. I'm always like, well, let's see who spoke the most. But I'm going to go with the one who really did impress me, which is Anna Paquin. I looked up her name to make sure I got it right. Um, because <laughs> I feel like uh, her performance does a really good job of kind of letting you see it Philip Seymour Hoffman's way, but also knowing that because she's a kid, it's not that way. And like seeing the pain, seeing the too much energy, the talking too fast, the like trying to, to be worldly, but not knowing what that is yet because you're 16. Um, And I just thought that like a lot shown through in every line that she delivered and you see someone who's in pain. And if what you're looking at is that she's scantily clad or that she's like, um, it has a tattoo on her belly, then mm-hmm. you're missing like a child that is suffering. Um, and all of that oh. is in her performance. And I think it's one of the more subtle aspects of like the entire movie in a way. And I, I it just carried the day for me. I what? concur with. Greg. Hey, look at that. Finally, director's signature moment. Greg. Okay. There's one that's so obvious, but it's not my personal issue, and I don't think I would even know it except for Ryan is the one who pointed it out to me. So I'm going to go with my personal one, which is, and I don't get this, and because if Spike Lee and I disagree with something about movies, I guess even though I'm on a movie podcast and he only makes movies, I guess I kind of got to go with his way of doing it. But (laughs) this thing where he shows something happen twice in extremely quick succession I don't like that. I, I can't wrap my head around it. I can't figure it out. With the, in this movie, it takes place with a, with human contact several times where people hug and then you get it like in two extremely quick bursts. It's not even clear if it's the same shot replayed or a, a shot from a different angle or something like that. And I'm chewing on it. I'm trying to figure it out. It does not work for me. It's one of those things that when it happens, it goes, hey, you're watching a movie. That's a choice somebody made, and I'm like immediately I'm kind of bounced out of the experience for a little bit. Um, Do you guys remember when we were kids and we were watching movies on like Saturday Network TV? And they would just constantly <laughs> chime in and be like, "Hey, you're watching a movie. <laughs> oh, hope you stay tuned." It's Saturday afternoon. Keep watching that movie. 
I the reason that I like this is because some of it was annoying and some of it was not, and some of it I'm not sure I caught. Like I think mm-hmm. there's three different levels of the way that he edits based on like the scene that I'm watching wow. where I didn't know it was happening or I knew it too hard or somewhere in between. I like that. What is your director's signature moment, Ryan? I, I have to would, Greg, what were you talking about? The obvious one or the one that you didn't know if I had Oh, okay. Um I think of this as like uh the ultimate um Spike Lee move, which is somebody is either vibing sometimes it's a good thing but a lot of times it's like a somebody is out of it so like anna paquin or uh, philip seymour hoffman right after he kisses her the like they step onto like a dolly or something and then they don't walk but they get like moved through the scene slowly um yes that's mine. but again yeah like i i i noticed it when it happened to black klansman but you were the first one i ever heard say like that's a thing that he does and i've no- you can't miss it. If once you know it happens, you obviously can't miss it for that point forward. But it's very conspicuous in this movie. Okay, so yeah, what I didn't want to go through, uh, or what I didn't want to go with, was the "fuck you" monologue because I do think that's specific to do the right thing. I don't know. I can't think of another movie that that would be. So that's not director signature. I think that the conveyor belt or the dolly shot is the most director signature thing. And I do. I am going to go with Anna Paquin over. Philip Seymour Hoffman. I think that Philip, C- Philip Seymour Hoffman's one is a little more subtle, but uh, it's also kind of I funny. Di- I didn't get the impression enough that he understood the amount of damage that he had done by mm-hmm. the conveyor belt. I think that what it, it's supposed to be sort of like a real time montage. Wow. Like you're going to go from point A to point B emotionally or Ooh. physically wow. or something, but we're just going to do this. In Anna Paquin going from. I'm a 17-year-old girl. Two, I'm a fucked up by drugs and alcohol, proud of being in a club 17-year-old girl, just by this conveyor belt. That's sort of all we need to know, like, what she's now in for. You know, it's sort of like... Uh, when she has the beads in her hand, she's doing the... Yeah, I mean, she's sort of floating, like and in more than one way. <laughs> The yeah. conveyor belt into like the haunted mansion of what? like You guys think you're in doom buggies, but like it's going to get so much scarier <laughs> from here. That is the awards. Finally, we end with recommendation. Greg, uh, what do you recommend? Um, this movie is about prison without being about prison. And I feel like in 2002, not that many people were talking about, like, what a black mark on the soul of this nation our prison industrial complex is. I had never heard of prison abolition before I read the book Are Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. I highly, highly, highly recommend it, even though it is now at this point almost as old as this what? movie. Um, but it makes the all the all the points now that have become a little bit more tried it or understood about prisons, which is that they are um, an institution descended from slavery and that still like perpetuate modern day slavery um, and just ask the question of like, is this good for our nation to be letting companies essentially force um, mostly minority populations into slave like conditions, depriving them of the right to vote. And I think all of that hangs over this movie without it being like totally fully engaged. The sexual assault stuff is a part of that. You know, that like if we can't properly house people, so that they're not, in addition to their punishment, sexually assaulted, then, like, we are failing as a nation. And th- this book really what? points out, and it's quick. It's a quick read, too. It's like 100 pages. Uh, it really points out the ways in which it is not tenable to be the kind of nation that we purport to be and then also have a prison industrial complex. It sounds like a uh, Ava DuVernay's documentary. It is similar uh, to that, yeah. Um the 13th, 13th Amendment. Is that? The yeah. 13th. Oh, yeah, the 13th. Yeah. Another another great resource for that or um, the – what's the the prison and Jim Crow? The New Jim the Crow. The New Jim Crow. That's another really good one. It's just longer, and that's not the, the one that got me yeah. first thinking about prison abolition was – I mean, 100 pages if you're going to recommend a book. Hell yeah, and that. it's like – Love that. What a delightful Saturday afternoon that uh, is. And yeah. uh, it's compelling. All I can say is that, like, on top of being an important issue and everything else, she writes with such verve and such um, understanding, and she conveys that so effectively. I don't think you can read this book and not come out of it being like, we need to abolish prisons. Like, I really don't think you can get all the way through it um, without feeling that way. 100% of the research and other things that other countries have done say that we should. Yeah. Oh, so you love crime? 
Ryan, what is your recommendation? Crime. Uh, <laughs> I think that we should Do commit it. crime, and therefore we'll prove that jail is wrong. Um, we have. I brought this movie up earlier. Uh, we made fun of it before because it's weird that uh, there was a Harvey Keitel movie where he shows his wiener in the 90s. Not the piano with Anna Paquin, but a different movie. Sorry for going to Yeah, dude, it. you just <laughs> Anna Paquin. <laughs> not the piano. Anna Paquin. Uh, but it, uh, Werner, Herzog, Werner Herzog made a sequel to a Harvey Keitel movie with Nicolas Cage <laughs> called Bad Lieutenant, <laughs> Port of Call, New Orleans. And it, there's a lot of things going wrong here, right? <laughs> like Nicolas Cage instead of Harvey Keitel... Um, one of the worst titles I've ever heard. Like, how many colons can you have in one movie? It sounds title? like a weird romp. It sounds like a broken lizard movie or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you've it... loved Bad Mom and Bad Santa. <laughs> yeah. Now, Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call. It's like all those ones. Happy Lieutenant movies came out, and then to buck the trend, <laughs> we're making Bad Lieutenant. This movies. ain't your daddy's lieutenant. <laughs> but it's Werner Herzog, and it's Nicolas Cage, and it's two of the two weirdest weirdos we've ever had <laughs> making a movie that's actually normal like actually sort of good uh and compelling it's a case but it's also not about katrina but it just has katrina in the background of like this movie is not about this but would this stuff be happening if it wasn't for this how would these characters be happening if katrina wasn't there and watching this movie since katrina happened since the first time i watched this movie it reminded me of it a lot i think it's a legit great movie that has so many things, like too many colons, going against it. <laughs> Oops, I'll call I would like to see the movie. Uh, mine is, if you want a movie about somebody... So this is... Monty is now fully in the drug world, but a movie about a Monty-type kid getting into the drug world and the, the DNA of the city is woven throughout the movie. I refuse to say the city is a character. Uh, I would I'm just going to clip it, dope. Mike, so that you... In the thing you just say, this and city is the say. character. <laughs> uh, but Dope starring Shameik Morris from Into the oh, Spider-Verse shit. fame. I love Dope. And a- afterwards, I was like, if you made a prequel of Monty getting into this, that is what Dope is. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a lot more fun. It's a lot less dark. But it- it's, I think, similar wavelengths. I love that movie. Also, real quick, can we recommend a Montgomery Clift movie? Sure. Uh, my favorite is Red River, where he plays John Wayne's little assistant, and it's full of like homoerotic stuff. But I do want to talk about Montgomery Clift real quick because uh, that's what our main character, who our main character was named after, and Montgomery Clift uh, didn't die, but got in a crazy gnarly uh, car accident that ruined his perfectly symmetrical screen actor face and just made huh. it completely shifted and scarred and ugly for the rest of his career. Uh, if that happens to an actor, sometimes they will go to drink and drugs until they die. And that's Monty Clift. Also, did you guys notice the giant poster wow. yes. on Monty's wall? Cool Hand Luke. It was Cool Hand Luke. The coolest prison movie there is. Do you think that that's supposed to make us feel like he's going to be okay in there? Or that like that's why all his friends think? Because like, a, cu- a couple of his friends are like, oh, you're going to learn all the angles and you're going to be running that place. Right. And it's like, no, that's from a movie. In real life, right. they're going to break my teeth with a pipe. And I, I think, think his Nikolai, yes, his, his like, Nikolai. Take Uncle the, Nikki, take the gun. You, 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 you're a different guy when you hold the gun, right? Like I think Nikki is calling all of Monty's horse shit out because Monty thinks he's cool handed. Yeah, I think the horrifying Ukrainian boss in this movie. I'm not talking about Zelensky. He's a cool Ukrainian boss. We love that guy. Not like the, yeah, not like the other Ukrainian bosses. But this guy is he is so horrifying to look at. He's like he's so scary, and I think he has been. Gang rapes multiple times. He's yeah. been he's led gang rapes like he has done it all. <laughs> that's that's he's doing it all, all, folks. <laughs> From soup from to, to nuts, Z. <laughs> living the dream. Well, now is the time when I have to sadly say, not all of us can be winners. Though in my heart, you both are. Hooray! But on but on I did paper, it. oh, no. Ryan, you got seventy one points. Yes. I I already knew that, but thank you. <laughs> wow. I can conf- I confirm that. That's my total that I see here as well. And Greg, you got sixty seven points. So Ryan is my best friend for the week. Good God. I thought for sure Greg destroyed good that God. one. Good God. Good God, Lemon. It was it was it was a lot. It was good. We didn't me- we- good show. Oh chat. We didn't mention Patrice O'Neill's in this movie. <laughs> oh yeah. Can <laughs> I get five points? <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, 
Mike, is there any way, real quick? Can I just get five points? Five points? <laughs> Greg, you got two tab. points, so you're at six. <laughs> Mike, Mike, nice. can I ask you a question? Yes. Because uh, wonderful job hosting a uh, wonderful conversation podcast. But did you hate this movie? I didn't hate it. Yeah, I, I tried to play coy, and then I was like, wait, when do I reveal how I feel about this <laughs> I guess now. And then how's it going to do? I think... The whole time while I was watching it, I was enjoying it because Spike, mm -hmm. right? So you're like, oh, what is going? What is going? And afterwards, it wasn't thrilling enough to be a thriller, though there were elements of that there. And it wasn't quiet and showed interiority enough to be a character study. And so I felt like it, it just waffled and never really made a decision to – it is my least favorite Spike Lee movie I have seen. Oh, you should watch Get on the Bus. Seen Bamboozled. <laughs> um <laughs> Hey, we all Greg, do you want to throw Dude, out a yeah. Spike Lee movie to talk shit? I up? mean, that that would be it for me, right? Bamboozled. That's the beginning of um, my like love hate relationship with Spike Lee, where I see the movie and I get angry, and then later I'm convinced that the anger is like actually a good thing. It's a gift, but I didn't hate it. I just uh, it left me feeling cool hand lukewarm. I guess I think this is also my least favorite Spike Lee movie, but that's just like like Mike said. That's still pretty high praise i mean it's still i'd rather yeah. watch a spike lee movie than watch a, a movie by almost anybody else so facts and he delivers an interesting performance and or you know um an interesting movie and but i just don't think that like it is going to perform very well overall i think that it is it made for a good conversation it was interesting i bet we um chop it up again in the last episode when we bring it up but i just Against some of the other contenders, I don't think it, it's got what it takes. I don't know. Based on your guys' lukewarm reviews, um, I think that it could do well. I think that your the the way that you like it's going to stick in your craw. That's sort of what mm. he does, you know, more than any other movie that we watch in this entire season, which is almost <laughs> over, by the way, guys. I know. We, 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 are... we said that this was going to last forever. We're Thank almost done. Wow. Um, I think that. Uh, this is going to stick in your craw. I think you're going to think about it more. I think that you're going to come to terms like, oh, you know what? The thing I hated, I loved. The thing I loved, I hated. Just the fact that those two things are possible. And also, like, what is the most O2 movie? Like, Yeah, it's pretty O2. How, how do you argue that any movie is more O2 than this? Yeah, it would be hard. Well, movies that could contend for that, that is our 25th hour show but coming up this season we have catch me if you can famously about 2002 morvan collar even more famous about 2002 and lord of the rings the twin towers the most 2002 movies until then keep watching those movies getting there <laughs>